We have such a tremendous faculty here at Stanford that when one is singled out to receive the John Bingham Hurlbut Award for Excellence in Teaching, it's truly the mark of an exceptionally gifted and dedicated teacher. This year, our class selected Professor Pam Carlin. Now, in part because I didn't have the guts to endure one of her cold calls, I never took a class with Professor Carlin, so I asked some of my classmates what Professor Carlin meant to them. One student writes, class with Carlin was challenging and entertaining all at once. It was like having a stand-up comedian as your teacher, except a stand-up comedian who knows everything about the law. <laughs> it's hard to think of another professor with such depth across as many fields of the law, and it's hard to think of another professor who's as genuine and bitingly funny as she is. Another student writes, Professor Carlin is just a straight-up inspiration. She's dedicated and outspoken towards the public interest, and unabashedly so. She's an inspiration to anyone who's ever pursued law, thinking even a little bit that they want to make the world a better place. Finally, one student succinctly wrote, possibly channeling a little gossip girl, OMG, I love Carlin, she is so hot right now. <laughs> High praise from all. Even though some of us have never had the pleasure of taking one of Professor Carlin's classes, I think it's fair to say that all of us in the class regard her as one of Stanford Law's finest. Professor Carlin has been incredibly dedicated and available to her students despite teaching several courses every year. She's been a public interest mentorship group leader She's heavily involved in student support, mooting students, helping with clerkship advice and applications, and she's helped groom future appellate rock stars in her Supreme Court clinic. And who knows, perhaps those young rock stars will someday argue in front of her. While serving Stanford in all these many ways, Professor Carlin has recently found herself on the short list of potential Supreme Court nominees. In short, we in the class of 2009 are proud to award Professor Pam Carlin with the 2009 Hurlbut Award for Excellence in, in Teaching, and we're lucky to have her address her today at graduation. Professor Carlin, congratulations. Members of the graduating class, spouses, partners, children, and friends of the graduates, parents of the graduates, their in-laws, <laughs> members of outlaw, <laughs> people who are bisexual, and people who are bilingual, and people who are biracial, people of color, people in the minority, other dissenters, people who want to do justice, and people who plan to be a justice, <laughs> people who represent the convicted, and people with convictions, people with backbone, people with biceps, people with six-pack abs, <laughs> people with staggering figures, and people who owe stupendous figures, <laughs> well-paid people and underpaid people, members of the staff, members of the faculty, people with citations in the Stanford Law Review, and people with citations from the Stanford Police Department, <laughs> and people who are just plain out of sight. Welcome to Stanford Law School's graduation. This is the last time that the class of 2009 will gather in one place, and the first time that none of you is shopping for shoes online, playing free sell, or checking the weather. It's as true today as it was two years ago in constitutional law. The weather outside is sunny. This is California. You do not need to check. <laughs> but if you have been online an awful lot recently, well, I confess I've been there too. My hands hurt from Googling myself. An awful lot of people I don't know have written very nice things about me. But the thing that has brought me the greatest pleasure over the last 10 days are the emails I've received from former students. And that's why the Hurlbut is so special to me, because I love this job. With all this internet world, I actually found out that you'd chosen me in the most wonderful way, not online by checking Kathy Glaze's email, but late on a weekend afternoon, when I came into the law school after a cross-country trip to meet with a team in the clinic 
working on a case so eye-glazing that Larry Marshall didn't even send around an email when we bored the court into denying cert. <laughs> Bev Moore, one of the team members, asked me what I planned to say. Getting to work with students like her and the rest of you is itself more of a reward than any prize could be. Over the last three years, you've become my friends, my colleagues, the people who challenge me with your questions, who inspire me with your plans, and who make my work days such a joy. Now, it struck me when I was thinking about what to say today that I graduated from law school 25 years ago this spring, and I turned 50 this winter. As most of you know from having had me in class, I tend to think in literary illusions. So what popped into my head almost immediately after that are the opening words of Dante's Divine Comedy. Nel mezzo del cammin de nostra vita. That's Italian, of course. Part of Dante's real innovation was to write in the vernacular and not in pretentious Latin. That's something worth remembering as a lawyer. <laughs> anyway, in English, the poem begins this way. Midway on our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods, the rigid road lost. The Divine Comedy is 14,000 lines of terza rima, a verse form that consists of tercets, or three-line stanzas, with the rhyme form ABA, BCB, CDC, uh, not Center for Disease Control, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, I thought for a moment of delivering a whole commencement speech in terza rima. And here's how I would have begun. <laughs> Midway through cramming for bar exams, when you're doubting why you took this journey, you may find some help in these pointers of Pam's. To control section five, look at Bernie. Squeeze the lemon test and you'll get messy. Gideon gives the right to an attorney. You think Eldred's wrong? Just thick of Plessy. <laughs> Abandon ambiguity, ye who enter here. On the MBE might as well be guessy. In the grand scheme of your future career, see the bar as purgatory is my advice. On this point, I am quite sincere. Study. Don't get entrapped in the bar's dark wood twice. <laughs> well, you can see why I soon stopped. <laughs> but something about Dante stuck with me, and maybe it's because I've gone to lunch with so many of you at Cool Cafe, and we always walk past Rodin's famous Gates of Hell on the trip. Anyway, the poem has three parts, the Inferno, the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. And in each part, Dante encounters a series of figures, both historical examples and contemporaries, who committed various sins or possessed various virtues and who are now reaping the appropriate punishments or rewards. Wouldn't we all like the world to work that way? <laughs> Imagine, Dante describes how flatterers, the people we call today suck-ups, find themselves mired in pools of sewage just like the garbage they spewed when they were alive. By contrast, great lovers and artists sit around heaven singing beautiful songs. If Dante were alive today, I imagine he'd consign to a special circle of hell the journalists and bloggers who've been writing nasty, unsourced stories. There, they'd find themselves blindfolded while people muttered nasty things about them behind their back. And he'd put heroes like Cesar Chavez in a special heaven filled with shady trees under which they could drink wine from grapes that picked themselves. <laughs> Bob Riceberg would run a 255 marathon while Larry Marshall starred in a revival of Fiddler. <laughs> As I said, the poem is long and you should read it for yourself. Today I want to draw some lessons, though, from three cantos that have struck with me ever since I first read the poem nearly 30 years ago with two of the teachers who have been an inspiration for my entire career, the late Yaroslav Pelikan and the late Bart Jamadi. They did more than simply strive to make teaching an art, which is what I received the hurlbut for. They actually succeeded. Now, the first canto I'm going to talk about is Canto Three of the Inferno, and it involves the vestibule to hell. Here, Dante enc encounters the futile, people who were never really alive because they never made any choices. These are the people who avoided taking any position on the great issues of the day. These are the people who held back from all real engagement and spent their whole lives trying to keep their options open. 
Now they find themselves endlessly running after a meaningless batter, banner that flutters in the breeze while wasps sting them. Don't be one of those people. Your first year of law school, on my way to a conference about Gonzalez against Carhartt, a case many of us discussed in class, I was riding on the New York City subway. The MTA has a great program called Poetry in Motion, which posts poems on the trains. And as those of you who are, who are in class know, I like to read you poems when I see you at the end of the semester. So while I was sitting there on the subway, I saw a short poem from Vera Pavlova that beautifully captures this first point. If there is something to desire, there will be something to regret. If there is something to regret, there will be something to recall. If there is something to recall, there was nothing to regret. If there was nothing to regret, there was nothing to desire. Now, I can't tell you exactly what you should desire to make of what Mary Oliver calls your one wild and passionate life. We're different people. But I can tell you how important it is to desire something and not to be so diffident or so cautious or so cool that you become one of the futile. So let me say something quite personal. Would I like to be on the Supreme Court? You bet I would. <laughs> but not enough to have trimmed my sails for half a lifetime. Sure, I've done things I regret over the years. But the things I regret aren't the things that keep someone from getting nominated or the things that keep someone from getting confirmed. I regret being unkind to people I love and respect and admire. I regret getting frustrated by little things. I regret never taking a summer off, and I regret my inability to diet. But I don't regret taking sides on questions involving the Voting Rights Act. I don't regret having to, having to defend the constitutional rights of criminal defendants. I don't regret litigating cases on behalf of gay people. And I don't even regret being sort of snarky. <laughs> One of the biggest differences between law school and life is this. In law school, you always know when the exams are, and you get a definitive grade, in your case, as the last Stanford class under the old grading system, an artificially definitive grade, a month later, or maybe two months later, or maybe three. Uh, in the real world, though, you won't always know when you've been given a test, and you may not realize until years later whether you passed or whether you failed. Now, there's a well-known book about high school basketball teams called In These Girls, Hope is a Muscle. Well, in a lawyer, courage is a muscle. You develop, by courage, you develop your courage by exercising it. Sitting on the fence is not practice for standing up. Now, most people stop reading after the Inferno. It's understandable. The Inferno, after all, has most of the great lines and most of the really fun stuff, just like hell. Uh, but there's just as much to learn from the remainder of the Divine Comedy. So let's talk a little about the Purgatorio. Much of Purgatory in Dante's cosmology is filled with people with undeniable virtues, but whose virtue was misdirected. In the 19th canto, in the fifth cornice, Dante dreams about the sirens, the nymphs who tried to seduce Ulysses and his men away from their journey. When he awakens from the dream, he and Virgil encounter the covetous. These people, who directed their talents only towards acquiring greater and greater wealth, were seduced from a better path. They do their penance by weeping face down on the ground to signify that they were too earthbound while they were alive. The message of this canto is not that material goods are bad. The people in the fifth cornice are not sent there rather than to heaven for making money. They're sent there for making nothing but money. It's okay to make a decent living. You have loans and families and an entirely human desire to live comfortable lives. Me too. I had loans. I have a family. I like being comfortable. 
Why else would I have spent $2,000 on a custom-made, bright orange folding bicycle? (laughs) But as Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote, while we do not pretend to undervalue the worldly rewards of ambition, we have seen with our own eyes, beyond and above the gold fields, the snowy heights of honor. Go there and make some snow angels. And so we come to a second point. He didn't say go there and make some snow angels. That was me. (laughs) But I hate those people who do the scare quote thing. I know you were thinking snow angels. And now you understand why you said three generations of imbeciles is enough. Um, And so we come to a second poem that I want to read to you. It's a poem that my colleague Barbara Freed once showed me. And I now read it to students at least once a year and to myself every time I update my CV. It's called Writing a Resume by Vizlava Zimborska. What needs to be done? Fill out the application and enclose the resume. Regardless of the length of life, a resume is best kept short. Concise, well-chosen facts are de rigueur. Landscapes are replaced by addresses. Shaky memories give way to unshakable dates. Of all your loves, mention only the marriage. Of all your children, only those who were born. Who knows you matters more than whom you know. Trips taken only if abroad. Memberships in what, but without why. Honors, but not how they were earned. Write as if you'd never talked to yourself and always kept yourself at arm's length. Pass over in silence your dogs, cats, birds, dusty keepsakes, friends, and dreams. Price, not worth, and title, not what's inside. His shoe size, not where he's off to, that one you pass off as yourself. In addition, a photograph with one ear showing. What matters is its shape, not what it hears. What is there to hear anyway? The clatter of paper shredders. Do not confuse your resume just because it's often called a curriculum vita with your life. Some of the most important things you do, even in your professional life, will never show on paper. Aim high. Contribute more to, contribute to more than your 401k, even if, like me, it's now a 201k instead. <laughs> Finally, we come to the paradiso a fitting place to end a talk at this world-class institution in paradise. Here, Dante takes us through a series of heavens. In the sixth heaven, the heaven of the just, for example, Dante describes the inhabitants as sort of a celestial card section at a cosmic football game. They spell out the command, love justice, you who rule the world one letter at a time. The gradual forming of the message teaches us that we approach justice by fits and starts, by trial and error. That's what it means to say that constitutional interpretation changes even as the text remains the same. And you can download the book for free from (laughs) www.acslaw.org. It's what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. meant when he said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But I want to focus for just a moment on an earlier canto, the 13th canto, where Dante encounters scholars and teachers in the fourth heaven. The scholars in paradise get to sit around in a sunny place, a kind of Stanford of the sky, and discuss their ideas with one another. And here's what you learn about them. They're intellectually generous. They see things from others' points of view. They don't jump to conclusions. They recognize the fallibility of all human judgment. Near the end, Dante is given some advice. In my quite free translation, but hey, no one ever said I was a strict constructionist, it goes like this. You'll make yourself a special breed of fool if you get blown up with self-confidence. If you think there's always an ironclad rule you can derive alone from sheer brilliance, that condemns others harshly but acquits you from your mistakes, that's hardly prudence. So my final message for you today is the importance of generosity and friendship and collaboration, of being careful and compassionate, of listening, listening to others 
and to the still small voice of your own conscience of forgiving both others and yourselves. Let me end with one last poem. It's not really a poem. It's actually a quasi haiku from John Hart Ely, the greatest professor, law professor in constitutional law in his generation, and the man behind whose desk I get to sit in pale imitation every day. He dedicated his masterwork, Democracy and Distrust, to his old boss with these words. For Earl Warren, you don't need many heroes if you choose carefully. The Paradiso is filled with heroes whose exemplary lives inspired Dante. I've found such heroes, too, in the pages of the U.S. reports, in the stories of the civil rights movement, and in my mentors, but also among my colleagues, my clients, my friends, and my students. My greatest wish for all of you is that you find such heroes for yourselves and that they inspire you to live the best life you can. Thank you and good luck on the search.